thank you for coming to the latest installment of our exit interview counterpoint series. Uh, for those of you that uh, haven't been following the whole series, the exit interview series has been what um, uh, the Institute of Politics and Public Services attempt to really create the first oral history of the Obama era and the Obama administration, focusing on six different issue areas that this administration has focused on and talk with the principals from the administration about what they think the legacy will be, what, how they think history will remember the Obama administration in their area. But true to who we are and, and the type of conversation we want to lead, we didn't want to have just an, another infomercial where the Obama administration got to write history the way they saw it. And so we came up with the Counterpoint series where we brought in prominent Republicans and conservatives to, um, uh, to provide a different perspective and balance out the conversation a little bit. And this afternoon's conversation, I think, will be really fascinating as we have one of the conservative movement's um, real great economic thinkers um, and, uh, and advocates uh, here to provide a different perspective to the one that Secretary, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew provided uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we want you to be involved in this conversation. We still have a few more while we're done with the actual administration officials. We still have a few more exit interviews following this one. The next one is tomorrow at 1230, where uh, Jim Connaughton, who um, was uh, part of the Bush administration's uh, environmental policy team, will provide a counterpoint to last night's conversation on climate change. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the economy, uh, which I think everyone would agree was one of the first big tests of this administration when it took office back in early January 2009. To introduce our moderator and our featured guest, I'm going to ask Hunter Estes, a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service, to come up and do the formal introduction. Uh, and we hope you all enjoy the conversation. Hello, buddy. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, very exciting counterpoint. Uh, today, moderating the conversation, we're excited to have uh, John Stanton. Mr. Stanton joined BuzzFeed as the Washington Bureau Chief in June 2012 and has covered Congress, the White House, and the Supreme Court in D.C. since 1997. Uh, Mr. Stanton has been called the, quote, last true renegade on Capitol Hill and has appeared on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, and is a regular guest on The Rachel Maddow Show and has also contributed to Meet the Press. Uh, as part of the counterpoint today, we're very excited to have uh, Grover Norquist. Mr. Norquist is the president of Americans for Tax Reform, a taxpayer advocacy group he founded in 1985 at President Reagan's request. Mr. Norquist also serves on the board of the directors of the National Rifle Association of America, the American Conservative Union, the Parental Rights Organization, and Center for the National Interest. He also serves as a contributing editor to the American Spectator magazine and serves as president of the American Society of Competitiveness. And on top of that, has authored multiple books. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about him, the Hill newspaper uh, named Mr. Norquist one of the top grassroots lobbyists of 2014, saying, they say nothing is certain but death and taxes. In Washington, the third certainty is that Mr. Norquist is trying to kill the second. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, and I, I apologize if I'm sweating like a Protestant in Mass, but it's a little warm there. Um, so, Grover, uh, actually, so Mo sort of started this off a little bit, sort of saying that the economy was like the big test, first test for the administration, and in a lot of ways, they are very clearly trying to use the sort of the, the beginning of the recession and how bad things were at the end of the election and the beginning of 09 as, you know, the the mark that we should be using to judge them going forward in history. And I'm actually curious, do you think that that's an appropriate mark? Is that, is that the metric we should be using, or do you think so? no? Well, it's, it's the card they were dealt when they uh, came in. Uh, and it's fair to say, notice we had this uh, recession as we came in. Uh, then you want to compare it to other recessions. Uh, and uh, do we have the second chart um, up? Here, if you compare, um, oh, okay, well, that's, that's um, uh, job creation. You can also look, there are similar charts that have uh, GDP and so on, but you take Obama from the base, bottom of his recession, uh, start turning around in uh, July of 2009 and the beginning of the end of 
uh, bottom of Reagan's recession in uh, 1982, December 82, uh, and you go out quarter by quarter there, uh, Reagan cr um, created more jobs faster. He uh, had more GDP growth. But it's not just the Reagan recovery, which was a very strong recovery compared to all others. Uh, it's worse than all the average of all the others. Uh, it's the worst recovery since the Great Depression. Uh, so it is fair to say, hey, they had a recovery. It's also fair to say they did more poorly in handling it than all other uh, recessions, other than the um, depression in or the collapse in, in uh, 28, which was then because they followed a series of policies, turned into the Great Depression. We had a great recession. It's not great. Neither was the Depression. We had a big uh, depression, and we had a big recovery, a, a big recession uh, under Obama and under FDR because they both tried to fix it by spending more money, raising taxes, regulating all the things that Reagan did the opposite of, and Reagan's recovery was stronger, as were each of the others. We tend not to remember the um, recession of 1921, which was a devastating collapse of the economy, uh, to which uh, the Republican uh, response was to cut taxes and not spend so much money, and you don't remember it because it didn't last very long. Uh, the, rec the recession at the beginning of the Reagan years was when we were collapsing out um, double-digit inflation, two years in a row, double-digit inflation squeezed down to, to next to nothing, and the redu reduction in the uh, uh, living standards that happened under the uh, Carter years as actual wages were, were heading down. Um, that was a short, painful, higher unemployment than, uh, than Obama had uh, at, the, at, the begin at, at the beginning of his administration, but he took a different path on policy. So, yes, he, had Obama uh, had an economy that's just sort of rolling along, you'd use that as the baseline for comparison. Mm -hmm. He had one in recession, uh, and he did more poorly than all the other presidents, except for FDR, who did more of what he did uh, with worse results than he had. Well, but, okay, so th this, this gets kind of maybe at a thing that I've, I've been struggling with for the last six months, but I've been out on the trail with mostly with Trump talking to people. And, you know, okay, so comparatively, let's say that, that he's not done as well as everyone else. But still, the economy is much better than it was eight years ago. And things are better. There are more jobs, there's more money, there's, things are better. But people certainly don't feel it. And mm -hmm. even people that are doing objectively better, whose wages have increased, who are maybe now once again employed full time, they still don't feel it. Yeah. They, they don't because it's not that much better. It's, it's not a strong economy. It's a weak economy. Um, you look at the number of, I mean, labor force participation rate has continued to decline. It, it fell during the recession, and then it got worse. Um, it went, continued to go down. Uh, usually, um, it gets better when a recession uh, comes to an end. Uh, and that's true for all age groups. Some people say, well, baby boomers, some of them are retiring. You, t you can take that out doesn't affect, it's still a declining participation. We've had more business failures than startups uh, during his presidency. Uh, one of the things people tend not to remember is there are always jobs being destroyed and created. And you know, so there were you know, X number of, during the Reagan years, there'd be millions of jobs ceased to exist. But net in 80, 1983, four million jobs were created. So four million more jobs were created than disappeared. Uh, and that's a dynamic economy, and that's actually a good thing, because things that didn't make sense anymore aren't being done, and many things that weren't being done before weren't being done well are being uh, improved on. Uh, so I think people are understandably grumpy. You look at uh, where in the election uh, the Rust Belt. The Rust Belt is the part of the country that's been most heavily unionized. It's the part of the country most damaged by the EPA and other regulatory bodies, uh, and it's the part of the country that has seen their jobs destroyed um, and people leaving uh, the neighborhood as a result. Uh, the parts of the country that are growing, Texas, Florida, are less unionized, lower taxed, no state income tax compared to the Rust Belt states, which it just doesn't just happen. There's nothing about uh, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, 
Michigan. This used to be where stuff happened in this country. So it's not the, it's the weather. The weather wasn't any better, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. The weather didn't change. What changed was they became overtaxed, overregulated, and the labor unions came up with work rules and made it impossible. The dying industries are the unionized industries. Well, That's not... Um, well, oh, it's only over... You're only overpaid if you're getting paid more than productivity. So the goal is you want rising productivity. With the damage that labor unions do are the work rules. Because they come in and say, you've been doing it this way, we're going to do it just that way, and there aren't any other ways to do it, and we have this contract. I mean, the policeman's, Giuliani told me, the policeman's contract is a foot high um, in New York City, okay? Uh, lots of rules about how you be a policeman. And the contracts for the you know, UAW and others have a whole bunch of rules, and everybody has to be treated exactly the same. Um, you can't have people with different agree. You know, look, I want to work on the weekend. I don't want to work during the day. You know, I, I, I want to. I want to take a different approach. I want to do piecework because I can do it better. No, no, everybody has to be exactly the same. Um, people aren't all exactly the same. All work doesn't come in bits that are all exactly the same. So the damage. I, I know some people say they raise wages and. If you raise wages faster than productivity, that will kill an industry. But if you have work rules which don't allow innovation and progress, that doesn't help either. Well, but I mean, also, uh, certainly a big part of that has to have been trade, right? And Obama, and presumably you guys would agree a fair amount on some of the trade policy that's been going on over the last couple of years, right? It's been an extension of kind of what started in the 80s, and then we had NAFTA and, and all that, so. Yeah. Trade is a little bit like a, a test, um, to, you know, they have a test in school to see what you learned, okay. Trade says, we've got all these regulations and we let the trial lawyers sue your companies and we let the unions set the rules and, and make things change slowly, if at all. Uh, and the EPA comes in and tells you you can't do certain things and everything gets delayed. Oh, and by the way, now you're competing with somebody from another country and guess what? They're 20 yards ahead of you. Well, how'd that happen? Well. Go back to the first part of the conversation. We've beaten some of these industries and, and states badly and then pushed them up and said, how come some other countries can create product at a lower, higher quality or better, lower cost than we can? It's not that we can't. We certainly could. Our own government policies have damaged guys. And then we kick them out and say, now go, comp you know, here, put these leg shackles on. Now go run a race with the Japanese and the Chinese and the Europeans when our top corporate rate is 35% uh, federal plus 4.8% on average state. So it's about 40% on average. And we're competing with, your, with European average of about 23%. Uh, and that's the average. So we're competing with Ireland at about 15 or 12 and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't do this to an American company and to American workers and then kick them out in traffic with people who aren't wearing shackles. I think the important thing, and, and yes, we could, we could have better trade deals because a whole bunch of our trade agreements stem from when we were the only guy standing after World War II and we were very generous to everybody else and we were carrying the weight of coordinating the non communist world and making sure everybody played well together and so we made concessions that you wouldn't necessarily have made if you were just trying to come up with a, a fair deal. We were helping people out. And I'm all for better trade deals, but the, the trade isn't the problem. Trade measures. The, we, the way they never learned in Argentina that they were going from one of the richest countries in the world to one of the poorer countries in the world was they threw up trade barriers. So they never took the test. And so they didn't notice until people left the country, that they were not being as productive as they might be. But there is the argument, and I think it's hard to see how it's not at least valid, is that the reason that, I don't know, I've spent time in, Tal in, in, um, mm -hmm. in Cleveland and I spent time in, in Juarez. And I'm pretty sure that no one in Cleveland wants to live in Juarez. And Juarez is a place where car company sent jobs that were, from, were in Cleveland. They sent them there because they don't have... <clears throat> not only just like the regulations, but they also don't have the infrastructure spending. They don't, like, you know, it's cheaper to do business all across the board there. But quality of life, even for somebody that has a, has a good job in a maquila that is not, you know, where you're getting paid dirt, they're still living in, in, in either in poverty or in pretty terrible conditions. Yeah. And it's hard, to, it's hard to see an American going for that. Okay. If wages were the only thing that mattered, all jobs would be in Bangladesh. It's productivity, um, and Mexicans can be productive. 
uh, and we should be competing by having the least expensive government, the, le the less destructive taxes, the less destructive tort system. We've got the worst tort system in the world where people get sued for all sorts of stuff, um, which wipes out jobs and destroys uh, companies and, and, and people's opportunity to get ahead. Uh, and we should have labor regulations and or laws that let people freely operate and make changes. So um, I think if we fix those things, people won't see, oh, the Japanese are a problem or the Japanese are eating our lunch or whatever. But we can see. We can work on both trade agreements and reforming our own mistreatment of our own workers and citizens in the country. Well, maintaining quality of life. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's central. The, the extra government doesn't make life better or the Soviet Union, East Germany would have worked. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> um, but one of the other legacies of the Obama administration that I think you actually had a pretty key hand in um, was, and I don't mean this in a way to sound at first, but the fact that, that after Obamacare got done and sort of once 2010 happened, mm -hmm. very little got done. And it became very much a town of everybody basically saying, I'm not going to compromise with you on both sides, frankly. Republicans in particular, though, became very, very strident that they were not going to, to give, give an inch at, at some point to Obama. And a lot of that seems to have originated with the pledge mm -hmm. or that you created. And you held, you held their feet to the fire for years to the point now that the pledge is just a pro forma thing for a lot of these guys. And, and it's just sort of a it's doctrine. No. Sure. Um, for people who may not have followed it, the Taxpayer Protection Pledge is something that I created in 1985, 86, uh, and shared it with uh, congressmen and senators. Originally, 20 senators and 100 congressmen signed it. Our goal was, and, and President Reagan endorsed it and campaigned on it in 86, urging people to take the pledge. Uh, this was because we were trying to pass the Tax Reform Act of uh, 1986, and nobody trusted a bunch of people to go into a room and make thousands of changes in the tax code and not have it come back as a tax increase unless enough people had said loudly and in writing with their signature, I am not voting. You know, if you go build this in that other room, because not everybody can be in the room while you're making sausage, and you bring it back and <laughs> we shake it and their tax increase, net tax increases in there, I'm out. So we had enough House, enough Senate, and a president says, I'll veto it. Then, you actually, then we could have a deal which was revenue neutral, not a tax increase. I would have loved the tax cut, but it was revenue neutral. Uh, Democrats controlled the House at the time. Uh, and the tax reform happened. So what the pledge does is it allows tax reform and big agreements to happen because people can trust that the politicians won't sneak tax increases in. You know, when you're making a dozens and dozens of changes, it's easy for something to sneak in. Uh, we now have uh, almost all the Republicans in the House and Senate have taken the pledge, many governors, state legislators. Uh, we have a majority of the members of the House of Representatives have signed the pledge, almost a majority in the Senate. Uh, and it really has, as long as the Republicans have had the House or the Senate, there's not been a tax increase. The only time you get tax increases in Washington, D.C., is when the Democrats have the presidency the House and the Senate, then they raise taxes, Clinton first two years, Obama first two years. And just one thing on comparing presidents, um, and to be fair to presidents and to Congress, it's not all about the presidents, see. Um, Congress has to vote, if you're doing stupid things or smart things, Congress has their fingerprints on stupid or smart. Uh, and I think it's better to think of the first two years of the Clinton administration as one historic period, and the last six years when the Republicans captured the House and Senate and said, we're not raising taxes, we're going to cut the capital gains tax, and did. Uh, we're going to reform welfare, which they passed three times. Uh, Clinton vetoed it the first two. Um, and Dick Morse, his pollster, said, if you veto it again, you'll lose the next election. He signed it. Uh, and so there were a series of spending restraints. Uh, he had planned to spend $250 billion uh, more than the tax increase he passed came in. So this was never to reduce the deficit. You go out 10 years from his, his own budget in 94-95, um, uh, in looking out 10 years, had the deficit about 250 the whole time. What happened is the Republicans took that spending off the table, and you end up with a balanced budget. You go to Obama. First two years, 
That was Obama. That stimulus, $800 billion, uh, regulating the, the banks, not Fannie and Freddie, but everybody else, not the guys who set the fire, but everybody else. Uh, and then um, they did Obamacare uh, and took, they took the $100 billion a year that was spent in Afghanistan and Iraq and put that into the baseline so that whenever those wars ended, and they're supposed to end in 2014, uh, and they've reduced in cost and scope, but that was going to be the permanent budget. So there's going to be, he put a trillion dollars of spending a decade in within you know, a few weeks of showing up at, at the White House. He said, we're going to be permanently increasing spending by a trillion dollars off of what we're doing now um, uh, into the future. Then the Republicans took the House in 2010, uh, and then later the Senate as well. And so the last six years of Obama are a very different set of policies, no tax increase. Um, and they did the sequester, which was the negotiated agreement on how to not shut the government down. He wanted two and a half, tri Obama wanted two and a half trillion dollars in debt ceiling increase. And the Republicans said, we need two and a half trillion dollars in spending restraint. Then we'll give you the two and a half in debt. And the first spending restraint was they took that trillion away from him, the trillion he'd put into the budget. That was taken off table. And the second trillion was taken off with the sequester, which brought spending from 24% of GDP. It had spiked up uh, down to about 20% of GDP. So spending as a percent of GDP came back closer to historic norms for the last six years. But, I mean, Jack Lula, when he was here, he called it the honorable, the notion of the honorable compromise. And, I mean, if you look at, like, Clinton, like, they did stuff. They did welfare reform. They did a bunch of other things, even while holding the line on taxes and spending. And now it seems like that has become, that that notion has infected almost every other aspect of governing to the point that people don't trust each other at all, right? Like, no one, Democrats certainly don't trust Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell, and Republicans don't trust Obama or Harry Reid or Nancy Pelosi to come to any kind of an agreement at all that they could ever live with without ever seeing the, the, the details of it most days, right? Sure. And, I mean, is that, it seems problematic, right, that, that we get in this position where we're basically treading water. Okay. Um, people who talk about bipartisan compromise um, are telling you how very old they are. Um, because they remember a time when being a Republican meant that you were born north of the Mason-Dixon line. And it's all it told you about a Republican congressman. He might be for more spending, he might be for less spending, he might raise your taxes, he might not, he might be for bunches of wars or not for bunches of wars. All you knew was that he was from the North and Democrats were from the South. Uh, and therefore you'd had conservative Democrats and conservative Republicans and they could get together on a bipartisan basis and argue with liberal Republicans and liberal Democrats. And sometimes the liberals won and sometimes the conservative won, but everything was bipartisan because the Jersey color didn't mean anything, um, except in some sort of historic sense. Um, you know, my great-grandfather beat your great-grandfather, ah, or something. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like the North and the South um, continued to have some sort of disagreement on economic policy um, that was regional. Um, and as race declined as an issue, then the South looked around and said, we could, we could vote on jobs and they, be, they moved towards the Republicans. And in the North, uh, a lot more of the people in the North became Democrats, so, uh, although less so in the, in the Midwest. So what you had was everything was bipartisan because the two parties weren't parties of principle. I'm very pleased, um, and the pledge has played a role in this, of saying that today, during the lifetime of Reagan, I think Reagan did this, he turned the Republican Party into the Reagan Republican Party. When he came to Washington in 1980, he was one of a handful of Reagan Republicans. There weren't Reagan Republicans in the Senate and the House to speak of, certainly not more than you, you could count in two hands. Uh, over time, almost all Republicans in the House and Senate are Reagan Republicans. Uh, I can't think of a Republican in the House or Senate who, if anybody's watching, would raise taxes. Some have impure thoughts from time to time. Um, and we try and speak to them about this. Uh, but 
there's one party, and the Democrats, no Democrat will not vote for a tax increase. They all voted for the tax increase in, that Clinton put forward. They all voted for the tax increase and the stimulus spending uh, that Obama put forward. So the two parties actually mean different things. One wants to go this way. Republicans want to go to limited government, less spending, lo lower taxes, less regulation. And the Democrats have a more expansive view of the role of the state in people's lives and would hi higher taxes and more spending and more regulation, more centralized control. And so if somebody wanted to go this way and the other party wants to go that way, what in the heck are you talking about when you say compromise? Because if you move that way, somebody just won and somebody lost. Uh, and I'm in favor of compromise in the sense that I'm always willing to move towards liberty as quickly as I can, recognizing it's more slowly than I'd like. So a small tax cut, we can live with that. Small spending restraint, we can live with that. But raising taxes and raising spending is not compromising. It's called losing. It's called moving in the wrong direction. Uh, if I want to move from Washington, D.C. to California and I get as far as Missouri, um, that's a compromise because Missouri is on the way to California. It's not treason to only get to Missouri by a certain date. But if my feet are all wet and everybody around me is speaking French, um, I've been heading in the wrong direction. I, that's losing. That's losing. That's not compromising. That's losing. Try and get to California, end up in France. Wrong. Okay? So what people, some of the Democrats said, well, we wanted the Republicans to compromise. No. No. It's like that scene in Independence Day where they have the evil uh, space creature and they say, what do you want? I want you to die. Okay. Um, what do you want? I want you to raise taxes. I want you to compromise and raise taxes. Da, 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 da. Raising taxes is not a compromise. It's losing. I want you to lose. And they would sound um, less open to and touchy-feely if they said, I want the Republicans to lose. Uh, and I don't understand why they seem to object. And we've, we've met with them. We suggested they lose. We suggested they abandon their principles and do what we want. And they didn't sign up for this. So I'm very disappointed. They're being disagreeable. That's nonsense. Um, and they know darn well that they're asking the impossible. Republicans don't expect uh, Obama. Well, I'm sorry. There were a couple of Republicans who thought Obama would sign the abolition of Obamacare. I, or said they did, okay? Yeah. That was not going to happen. Uh, and so you govern within the bounds of what's possible, even for your opponents, because um, the Ds were not going to vote to end Obamacare. Right, but it, it, it plays both ways, right? I mean, Republicans aren't looking to compromise with anybody, unless it's you lose. Yes, I'm in favor of winning for freedom. Right. Yes, this is not negotiable. Um, but look, what we have is two honest parties, right? I mean, in the past, you elected a Republican or a Democrat, they get into Washington and, and surprise, <laughs> I didn't tell you, but I'm for the tariff, or I'm against the tariff, or I'm, you know, what, whatever the issue of the day is, these guys could, not only could they change their mind, they could be paid off with earmarks. And that's why getting rid of earmarks is so helpful because earmarks are what you give to a politician to vote against his or her principles. And they always involve corruption. You don't give somebody a free bridge just because it's not free. It's expensive. You know, we'll give you a bridge in your district. We'll steal money from other districts. We'll give the district to your... And you will vote to screw your constituents in a way that hopefully they don't see. And they'll say... And when they ask you why you did it, you say, look at the bridge. Look at the bridge. See the bridge? Stop asking me about that lousy tax vote. Look at the bridge. Um, so I think during the Obama year, I mean, we ended earmarks. It was a Republican victory, but um, largely ended earmarks. It, it, they're more complicated, more difficult to get. Uh, you don't end robbery. You don't end bank robberies. You discourage them. Uh, and uh, largely earmarks are gone. If you listen to the appropriators, people, the guy who had, headed the transportation committee in Florida, just Micah, just lost. How's that happen? Well, you can't print money from that committee anymore. Um, it's not the committee that would make you everybody's best friend if, if you were taking all that money and shelling it back to your district. Although now you have, and this is, I think, a part of Obama's legacy, which he's not going to particularly like, but you have Donald Trump now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It's hard for me to look at Donald Trump and see a Reagan re Republican there. Okay. <laughs> Several things. One, um, the presidency is an important job. Mm -hmm. 
he gets to sign bills that the House and Senate pass. So when you back up and look at the country, you see Paul Ryan, who is Ronald Reagan of a different era, but, but the same set of principles, uh, and Mitch McConnell, who's l in, largely in the same zone. Uh, these are Republicans who want to give people more opportunities and less control over their lives. Uh, they are exactly where Reagan was on regulation, exactly where Reagan was on taxes and spending. Matter of fact, further than Reagan was ever able to go or think about parental choice and education. Uh, so a number of these issues are more radical. I think clearly Reagan got that as an issue, but it wasn't one that he could work on at the time. Uh, so, the, and Trump leads with a dramatic tax cut. The, the abolition of the Obamacare tax increases. Obamacare was a series of 18 tax increases with a stethoscope laid on top of it. So it's about health care. Uh, no, it's about 18 taxes, trillion dollars in taxes, a trillion dollars in taxes over 10 years. That's all going away. That's step one. Um, and then he's got significant tax cuts. He's focused on regulations more than any Republican running for president since Reagan on regulations. Uh, he has a different sense on trade, um, but I think at the end of the day, he's not against trade. He wants fair trade, and he thinks some of the deals have been unfair. I'm all for negotiating better deals. I think eight years from now, people will say, when he cut taxes and regulated less and spent less, that's what turned the economy around, and we're kicking backside on international trade because of those three things. I think the better deals is a fraction of what we can accomplish with, and I left out tort reform, just a like tort reform, labor law reform, lower taxes, less regulation. But you also have, I mean, if you look at, at what he said, assuming he is going to try to do mm -hmm. some of the things he said he's going to do, he's not going to be able to bring companies back into the United States without giving them a lot, and that's going to include large amounts of spending on infrastructure, mm -hmm. potentially, essentially what are earmarks, whether they're done through the executive branch or through Congress. I mean, those, these are things that are, you know, that you guys just don't agree with. But the people that mm -hmm. support him, certainly, I don't think, you know, that your average steel worker in Ohio or Michigan is going to say, don't give them an earmark to bring a steel plant here, right? Y yes, but that's not... Go back to Obama's legacy. Obama's legacy is, and it'll be clearer when Trump creates his own legacy, which is what you said, he was the greatest destroyer of infrastructure in the country absent, well, we've never had a tornado or a um, earthquake that did as much damage. The uh, infrastructure we need on pipelines he shut down the, the critical pipeline coming down from Canada. Uh, there are 28 major infrastructure projects, all paid for with, with private money, in, investors' money, not a dime of taxpayer dollars here. Uh, seven major ones in Pennsylvania. There are a lot of them in the whole areas where you, you're, you're doing more fracking, which declined in federal territory that Obama controlled and jumped on private land and state-owned land. So the economic growth that came from um, the fracking revolution, the new technologies in, in getting energy and discovering new energy, it's found another trillion dollars worth of energy in further west Texas. Um, one, you're gonna need pipelines there. So when he allowed various agencies to delay all of these projects, and the 28 major ones that are all being delayed by the federal government, um, and the Chamber of Commerce used to have a book of a million jobs that are all being not existing. They're, they're ready to go. You know, shovel ready? They really are shovel ready. The, the company's all set to go. They've got the money. They're ready to go. And they're waiting for the GD permit. Because some guy in D.C. can't have your permit. Um, that's the destruction of, of, of very important infrastructure. Delay. But in some cases, destruction. Because you wait long enough, people make other plants. They buy their gasoline from somebody else. Uh, so that ends the regulatory assault on infrastructure, pipelines, um, and, and uh, ports, and liquefied natural gas exporting uh, uh, equipment. That
can all be done, doesn't cost a penny. And when he talks about a trillion dollars of infrastructure, he's not talking about a trillion dollars of government money. He's talking about 150 billion in tax credits to get people in the private sector to hurry up and do something faster than they might otherwise have done. I'm not sure that's always a good idea. It's always dangerous when you're handing out even tax goodies. But there may be points where to do it faster, more. Um, he's, he campaigned on that. He wants to do that. Uh, but the infrastructure that has been delayed and destroyed under the Obama years because he didn't like the pipeline, and the, it's not just one pipeline, but there are a series of them, uh, those are important parts of infrastructure that will now be built that weren't. Well, roads and bridges during the Obama years, it's not, he didn't start this, uh, but 20% of the money that you pay when you buy gasoline, pay gas tax, to build roads, right? 20% of it siphoned off to mass transit. Not people who used mass transit pay to build mass transit. You, who don't use mass transit and driving a car, get to have be taxed. And the money that was supposed to be widening your road was supposed that they'd tell you every time they raise the gas tax that they're going to widen roads, build roads, um, gets siphoned off to other stuff, parks or whatnot. And you may argue parks are good, fine. But you're siphoning money that you told everybody was going to roads, and you didn't. And that, uh, and then secondly, in addition to siphoning off gas tax money into non-roads, which is why we don't have, the roads aren't as safe as they should be, the bridges aren't as safe as they should be, uh, they found this was going on in Wisconsin. Governor Scott Walker, when he came in, discovered in the previous 10 years, a billion dollars, that's a lot of money for a state, but a hundred million dollars a year was taken out of the gas tax money and just spent on other stuff. They were taking, they were shoplifting. They were stealing that money that was set aside. And so they passed a constitutional amendment, which the people of Wisconsin voted for, to make it impossible. If we have a gas tax, it's going to go on roads, it's not going to be taken off for some other um, politician expenditure. So there are a number of things we can do to get more money into roads, starting by stop the leak uh, or the theft out of the gas tax. But add to that Davis-Bacon. Davis-Bacon is a law that was passed in the 1930s specifically and out loud in order to stop African Americans from the South from coming up and competing with white unionized labor. Uh, very similar laws were passed in South Africa uh, to stop uh, people from the Bantu stands coming into the cities and competing with white labor. Uh, and so you say, you have to be paid this much, and this is what a highly trained person gets. What's that mean? No untrained person ever gets the first job. Uh, and the, con the people who had the contracts before keep the contracts with the labor they had before. It kills new entrants, and it had a racial implication. I went and talked to an important congressman who wanted to talk me into supporting a gas tax increase. Uh, I think that was rather foolish on his part. I'm not <laughs> sure who told him this was a bright idea. Uh, but, but I went, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to conversation, not compromise in the wrong <laughs> direction. But I'm going to talk about anything. Uh, and I said, why don't you get rid of the Davis-Bacon Act? You could have 25 to 30 percent more roads, more bridges every year than we have without that law. States have repealed their mini Davis-Bacon Act. West Virginia just repealed it. Uh, Wisconsin Senate just repealed. A number of states over the years have, have repealed these. When they modified the one in Ohio, uh, they could build 11 schools for what used to cost 10. So they got a free school by getting rid of that regulation. They didn't even get rid of the regulation. They just reduced the damage. Done. And what this elected official said to me was, when I said, let's get rid of Davis-Bacon, you can have more roads. He said, do you want all your roads built by Hispanics? So it's still a racist law, um, and it should be gotten rid of because it's a bad law for taxpayers and it's a bad law for roads, and also because it's a goddamn racist law. Um, it was put in that way, it has that effect, and they know it has that effect, and the people to this day, not just Davis and Bacon, Mr. Davis and Mr. Bacon were saying it, but people now. Um, so there's a lot we can do to get more uh, and again, Obama supported the Davis-Bacon Act because labor unions like it, uh, and continued siphoning money away from roads. That has got to stop. Um, actually, I have, I have one last question, but I'll wait until we get some questions from the audience uh, first. So, yes. 
Um, so you mentioned uh, President Obama's opposition to the Keystone Pipeline and other pipelines. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, you support it. I'm wondering about sort of like the intellectual consistency of that position because pipelines, I mean, takes spending to build and they create jobs in the short term, but many analyses said that like once it was actually built, there would be very few jobs created in the long term. So if the kind of point of your um, economic philosophy is cut back on spending, create jobs for the long term, what's the rationale behind the pipeline? Well, I'm not against spending. I think you should be able to spend all the money you earn. And I think uh, everybody who says, I've got a pipeline, and I think it's going to make money because we can move something from the northern Canada where there are caribou and they don't have any use for it, and so we take the nice oil and natural gas and bring it down here to people who have some use for it, um, and they will pay for it. Caribou won't. And so we'll make money. This will be great. Uh, and you invest your own money in the pipeline. These are not, these are not government projects. Uh, so I'm, v I'm all in favor of infrastructure spending. In Europe, they do a lot of privately run roads, and we do privately run bridges and, and actually roads as well. Uh, they offered to, um, some company offered to buy the turnpike, the Pennsylvania turnpike, which is run by the government, for more than $10 billion. And then they were going to take that money and pave the rest of the state. And they would then have a toll on it, which is roughly the same toll that they have now. But they weren't going to have all of the very highly paid toll collectors with the contracts that they had in the past, and they could make money, uh, and promise to keep the road up there like the one in Indiana. So there's a lot of roads that we could um, privatize, toll, and build other roads with, with those sales. Um, and there's no reason why every ro road has to be either built or maintained by the government. Uh, you can do that contracted out. It's been done in Europe's way ahead of us on this. Uh, but. European company, Spanish company, um, just did one of these in uh, uh, North Carolina. And this, every once in a while, somebody goes, maybe they'll come and steal the road. I don't know if you remember. Remember the Queen of England used to own some farmland in the United States, and people were all worked up, and I kept thinking, what's the concern? <laughs> that, that she's going to grow rutabaga or something that we don't like on it? Um, or that she's going to take it home with her? I mean, it, 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 so... Uh, I think that more spending on infrastructure is important and necessary, but it doesn't have to be the government. Government doesn't have to build pipelines or railroads. This has all been built in this country largely privately. Although you do have things like, like you mentioned earlier, which sounds like you're not a huge fan of mass transit spending. Mm -hmm. the, you, to do that affordably so that poor people can use it effectively to get to work, it's, it's going to be very difficult for private companies to do that. So I, would, I would certainly think it would be a good idea to take a look at that rather than assume that the state should do it. We know when the state does it, you start with a 25 to 30 percent off the top handicap of Davis-Bacon. Um, so you can make things more affordable. Plus the other one is this idea that we're going to have these huge fixed mass transit deals in a world with um, cars that are self-driving. Um, this, this changes everything. I wouldn't be doing any massive dig holes in the ground and assuming people are going to want to go from hole number one to hole number two on a regular basis. I think people are going to be living in different places and operating differently. I mean, the length of a commute you could tolerate if you're not driving but reading and, you know, and doing other things is, is a much uh, easier commute. And if you can get right to where you're going as opposed to drive to the train, train to here, or get off the train, um, I think there are real opportunities on increasing people's transportation options. I, I think we should be looking at how people want to live their lives, and the government should get out of the way, and if they can, be supportive, but not start with, we have a plan, and the rest of you will all be living under it, and we'll tell you what you're going to have to do. That was Obamacare, which was the top down instead of bottom up, giving people more choices. They gave people fewer choices, you will do this. There are these kinds of health insurance, and you will buy these, and you won't buy anything that doesn't look like this. Um, that's not the way people want to live their lives, and that's why it's going to, because he tried to do top-down, it's going to be ended um, and replaced with something that's consumer-based um, and citizen-based. Part of the Obama legacy is that we normalize this sort of behavior on society? 
Um, Google national debt and deficit mentions um, during the Reagan years. Then Google it during the Clinton years. <laughs> then Google it during the Obama years. Um, deficits, debt, and homeless people don't exist uh, in, uh, on CBS, NBC, or ABC during presidential presidency, the Democratic presidencies. Um, and so they don't talk about, I mean, there's been almost a doubling of the debt during Obama. And uh, it's not a topic of conversation on CBS or NBC or ABC. Uh, when you look at Reagan's spending on defense, he plussed it up, and then when we're in the Cold War, he cut it back down again. He redu it was reduced by more than it was increased. So if you want to talk about a spending program that worked, the point was not to have a big shiny army, isn't this cool? The point was to win the Cold War, we won it, and then you didn't have to have all the, as many people and as much stuff uh, in, in the military. And, and st state spending went from 6% of GDP down towards three. Um, because we'd spent wisely, and then we stopped overspending, what would have been overspending, without the Soviet Union um, sitting on top of half of Europe. Uh, so, yes, um, the, the debt has not been talked about for the last eight years. As soon as Trump gets to be president, and every time he wants to cut taxes, they'll talk about the deficit. It will be back. It will be big. It'll be huge. It'll, be, it'll now be important. For eight years, it wasn't important. And homeless people will show up again on the pages of the New York Times. I was wondering about tort cases. You said that we should have really changed the tort law as a backstop to the Constitution. My understanding is that law, those kinds of things allow people who've been wronged by covert corporations to sue and protect their individual rights. So I was just wondering what you, could, what you thought about that. Sure. Um, we have a very expensive uh, tort law situation in the country where it's easy for people to sue each other, companies sue each other, people sue each other, um, and can get a whole bunch of money way beyond uh, any damages that, that took place. Uh, there are particular counties that are known as judicial hell holes because they have juries that uh, give egregious, um, it's not justice when you go into one area and the people there know that when they go on a jury, um, well, first of all, there's, there's some out-and-out -out corruption, people getting paid to vote the way they do. Um, but also, they, they shop to find juries that will give you uh, rather strong. The, the person who spilled hot coffee on themselves and sued McDonald's because coffee was hot. Um, there's some ridiculous lawsuits that, that um, shouldn't exist. I do think if somebody's uh, drunk or on drugs, they shouldn't be able to sue if they've hurt themselves. Um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of questions uh, in terms of how those lawsuits are done. Um, they now sue companies and say, we want to, everybody who did, this one, AT&T, you overcharged everybody 20 cents. So everybody who worked with AT&T gets a, a, a 20 cent coupon. And the lawyers get cash. Um, and the company's generally willing to pay off the lawyers because they're less expensive than the, the, the like, okay, fine, everybody gets 10 cent coupons. They're not going to turn them in, and we pay off the lawyers to go away. Um, there's some real problems. Right? We do worse than other countries um, in how expensive uh, civil lawsuits are, um, and they do a lot of damage to the economy. Yes, somebody should be able to sue for real wrong. Sure, absolutely. That's, that's not, they, they, people sue for real wrongs in Europe, too, but they don't pay anywhere near the cost that we pay. I know, I know it's like your, your bailiwick, but what, what do you think about the libel, the proposal to sort of go towards an English version of libel law for media? Um, I don't think you can do it with the First Amendment. Um, uh, I, my assumption that was Trump saying, I'm really irritated at how you guys treat me. <laughs> uh, I don't think there'll be legislation moving through to change the First Amendment. Okay. One more question? You're certainly seeing that at the state level, uh, where we have 50 states, and you can see, if we can put the state map up, uh, and, and this came to your earlier question about um, what does Trump mean uh, 
because isn't he, you know, the president, he's a Republican, and he has a slightly different view on certain things, uh, or said he did during the, the campaign. Um, the 26 red states have a Republican governor in both houses of the legislature Republican. So if the Republicans all get along, they can turn their state into Texas or Hong Kong uh, as quickly as they want. There are four blue states where the Democrats have complete control. Uh, Oregon, California, Hawaii, and Rhode Island. They used to have Vermont. They lost the governorship in this election. They used to have Connecticut and Delaware. Uh, two of those bodies are split now. Um, but as you can see, uh, a thousand, during the Obama years, part of his legacy is that he lost a thousand Democratic state legislators across the country, lost um, another 47 this last election, um, and that has shifted the economic policies of the country. Whereas Obama declared war on the uh, vaping industry. Remember, his FDA says he's going to they're going to ban, prohibit 98 percent of vaping products. That will be undone now by a Trump administration. It's probably why the senator from Wisconsin, the Republican, got reelected. It was his cent one of his key issues, <clears throat> and 10 million Americans vape. Um, people have won and lost elections on that topic. Is if you don't vape, but you might go. Anyone really cares? Yes, they do. Uh, uh, the sharing economy, Uber. Lyft, Airbnb, Arizona passed a law forbidding local governments from harassing Airbnb, people who want to rent part of their house out to someone. Um, in state after state, they're passing laws so that local governments can't go after uh, uh, Uber and Lyft and other ride-sharing uh, firms, uh, as Austin did in Texas. So we're seeing what was a, Hillary Clinton ran saying she wanted to crack down on the independent contractor sector. And the reason to bring this up in the context of Obama was that a third Obama term, Hillary Clinton getting elected, would have allowed a series of regulations on labor law that he put into effect to take full effect. There's one that says anybody who earns less than $50,000 a year has to punch a clock, right? So if you're, if you're making less than $50,000 a year, you have to be hourly not a salaried employee, as a lot of people think. I'm salaried, I'm a professional, I do my job, um, and I don't punch a clock. No, if that, that regulation hasn't gone into effect, it will probably be now undone, but it would have turned you into punch clockers, clock punchers. Um, and you, then everybody, if you wanted to take too long to write an article, you'd have to do time, you know, get paid time and a half, or if you worked on Saturday instead of Friday, um, yeah, except keep the job if you're, yeah, <laughs> if you're the slow writer. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the challenge there is that they were going after the independent contractors, and they had a, one of the NLRB rules that Obama put forward uh, would outlaw, make it impossible, uh, franchises. You know, how, you know, some people who own a McDonald's, and they own the McDonald's, and they, they're the franchisee, um, and they hire people. This would say, you're not an owner, you're not an entrepreneur, you work for McDonald's. You're an employee, and um, they're doing this, one, so they can unionize all these firms, uh, and two, so they can sue them, because no good suing one guy. You want to sue the whole company for the hot coffee that they spill on themselves, um, and as a, as a means of social control. Um, the Democrats have, are on a war against Uber and Lyft. You, you see the comments from Elizabeth Warren about how much she hates Uber. Um, and Sanders also uh, doesn't like Uber because that's 700,000 people who set their own hours, make their own decisions. It's a second job for a lot of people. I mean, talk, I ride Uber a lot and Lyft. Um, I always ask the driver, how long have you been doing this? How do you like it? These are the happiest guys you'd ever talk to. It's, it's, it's an addition to what they do. I know doctors who are doing it part-time and professors, and um, it, it gives them the freedom to work when they want to, and they want to, that the NLRB and the Obama reforms want to say, no, no, you're an employee. You have to punch a time clock. You have to do this. You have to do that. Um, and be an employee, not a self-employed person. And more Americans particularly younger people, like to be self-employed, like the gig economy, the sharing economy, being able to make these decisions uh, for themselves. And so the 
eight-year war against the sharing economy's growth that Obama and his Labor Department ran, and the tax people. Um, it's, difficult or it's difficult to run out and tax self-employed people. Easier to say to a corporation, you have to pay us taxes for all your employees. just makes it easier to get the money. We don't organize people's lives around ease of tax collection. We organize the government about ease of people's living and their life. So that effort by Obama to delay, damage, uh, and ultimately destroy the franchising structure in the country, which is an American invention. We do it more than other people. Uh, and Lyft and Uber and Airbnb. You saw it in New York. The governor of New York signed a law basically outlawing much of Airbnb. Democrat governor, Democrat legislature. Um, Arizona passed a law, Republican legislature and governor, just the opposite, saying nobody messes with people's property rights. It's your house. You rent it to anyone you want to. Um, in part or in whole, up to you. Uh, so look at that Republican map and you see um, one of the legacies of the Obama eight years is people who couldn't necessarily vote against um, all of his policies voting to elect state legislators and governors who are moving in the freedom direction for the sharing economy, the gig economy, the 1099 economy, and away from centralism towards more liberal labor laws. Uh, they passed four states now during the Obama years. Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, and West Virginia have all passed right to work laws. So if you're a union member, you don't have to join the union as a condition of employment. They can't fire you because you don't pay union dues. I don't want to be part of the union. Leave me alone. And they have to leave you alone. Um, and so those four states, tremendous progress. Another three states because of the election, New Hampshire, uh, Kentucky, and Missouri will all become right to work as well. So the effort by Obama to cartelize labor law, to make everybody fit in the um, Procrustean bed of 1920s unionism failed, did a lot of damage to the economy, but failed and will now, is now being undone at the state level and at the federal level with a Trump presidency. Um, I think we're about out of time. I have one quick other thing. It's a personal question, though, um, more than about, certainly about the economy. Okay. Um, Burning Man? Burning Man. <laughs> How much XC did you take at Burning Man? Uh, no. Um, you don't have to answer that question. Uh, okay. No, you have become, um, you've been under attack over since long as I've known you, almost 20 years, from certain elements of the conservative side of the world um, for not towing the line sometimes on some things, particularly on religion. Um, there are lots of people who see you and your wife as being some sort of Sharia law masqueraders here to take over the country. My wife's Muslim. Right, his wife is Muslim. Um, Donald Trump has definitely um, ushered in, I, I would argue they, that there was a calculation to it, but maybe there wasn't, but regardless, these people are now much more vocal. They are much more in people's faces. We've seen a spike in attacks on Muslims in this country since the election. How much does that concern you? And what do you think he needs to do as the leader of the country to put that back down? Sure. Um, I, actually, I, I do hope that Romney gets to be the Secretary of State because <clears throat> the Mormons are, uh, Mormons and Jews are the two most hostile to this idea uh, that people should single out religions and pick on them because they have memories. <laughs> uh, the Mormons are in Utah because people were shooting at them all the way from you know, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri. Uh, they headed out. There was actually an executive order to shoot Mormons in Missouri. And I'd heard about it. And then I said, I've really got to go look this thing. It can't really say that. That's just, I mean, it must be some, but it is. It's an order from the governor to the National Guard to come up from the south to drive the Mormons out. OK, let's not shoot them. And then to or, the, the other guys to come in behind them to stop the retreat. Um, so it wasn't just, I want them moved further west. It was, I want them shot. Uh, that executive order, by the way, was not formally repudiated undone um, until, I think, the 1970s uh, at the request of Orrin Hatch, who's Mormon, <laughs> talking to his fellow senator, then became governor of, uh, of Missouri. Uh, so it, I think that we have a lot of work to do. Um, 
but the good news is this is a very ecumenical movement to um, be open to both freedom of religion uh, and uh, intolerance. Uh, and we've been through this in the country. I mean, we've been mean to everybody who showed up for a while. And they go, oh, okay. And, uh, and then our children marry their children. <laughs> and then we all get together against the new guy. Um, it's unfortunate, but we get over it as opposed to some European countries, which have been doing this for a thousand <laughs> years. And they never get over those guys on the other side of the river. They're no good. Um, and, and they're still no good, even uh, a thousand or two thousand years later. Um, so we'll work through it. It's, it's unfortunate. The numbers are actually quite small uh, of, of annoying people who, are, who have a problem with religious liberty. But we'll, we'll get there. Um, but it does take, it, it's helpful when you have courageous people. Jeff Flake, for instance, uh, in Arizona. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.